welcome to the stable stage we have a very fun and exciting stage today which is invoke ai episode two if you guys missed episode one it is available on our youtube you can go check it out we basically just covered install and some of the basics and in this episode we're going to be diving in a whole lot deeper getting some more tips and tricks from uh the man the legend himself kent who will be um walking us through a bunch of stuff and i'm really pumped because i have been uh, penelope again my computer i named her um was like working for like a day <laughs> this week and i did get to get on and uh play with invoke a lot um during that day and i had a lot of fun and so now i'm excited to learn all the things that i wasn't doing right or didn't um didn't catch or didn't know i'm sure you did everything perfectly we'll just add to the uh amount of fun that you're gonna have the next time you play uh with Penelope. i really only did what we did last time which was like some <laughs> canvas stuff hey it's great it's great it's super fun um one thing that i do think would be nice uh where i'm fully open to is uh you know people sharing their thoughts questions things they want to see yes um so 100%. feel free to post those in the stage yes. chat uh, as well and then you know Throw wherever you want to there's something you specifically have a question about etc yeah um because we're, we're going to use this as kind of like a free exploration time uh just to kind of yep. go through and create some fun stuff um, is there anywhere that you specifically wanted to start emily yeah, I see a question so right there. Dynamic... Hands up. <laughs> you know what dynamic prompts are? Dynamic prompts. That's a good. That's a good call out. We didn't cover that last time. Uh, dynamic prompts are effectively just no. uh, if you're used to Auto eleven eleven and the dynamic prompts library. There, uh, mm -hmm. syntax is the same. Uh, core use case is the same. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, what you can do is pass in a variable inside of your prompt, uh, basically kind of the curly braces, and put in a couple of different words that you want to explore and see how they might impact the prompt. And so, you know, we'll start with the curly braces here. And maybe we want to see a black and white line art sketch. And then we want to see a colored pencil line art sketch. And then we want to see a... Uh, I don't know what else you'd do. Charcoal, yeah, charcoal line art sketch. Oh, um, water and then, color. Yeah, we're gonna do any any. I don't know that you do watercolor line art sketches, but okay, it's not yeah. gonna reject the you prompt. Can do it. You can. You, you can. can do exactly. It, okay. You can do it. Let's uh, see what happens. Okay. And then what are we? What are we doing? A uh, sketch of maybe maybe a fruit prompt. of some sort. Sure. Okay, a fruit. Well, you know what? What are you so prompt picture? A swamp. <laughs> A swamp. Oh, creature. a swamp picture. Okay, swamp creature. I was like a prom a picture. <laughs> uh, swamp a creature. Swamp creature. Swamp <laughs> creature. Uh, I'm sure it would do it. You know the power. The power of uh, power that of it all. That would be. We should do a prom picture. Um, I mean, we yeah, can see this. After those, after this. Yeah. Um, so then we need to turn on dynamic prompts so that it'll do that. What you'll notice is uh, images will get grayed out. And that's primarily because it, okay. the number of images that you're generating is dictated by how many prompts you're passing in, right? Gotcha. Um, and so that'll, uh, that'll do that. And, you know, we'll just, um, I'm going to turn combinatorial generation off. That just allows you to generate like 100 of certain prompts or whatever. So I'm going to turn that off for now. And what I'll do is I'll just go through each one of these. Um, is there anything else you want to change before I hit this button? Um, I don't think so. Let's just start with the with the basics. Okay, we'll do that. Or the basics uh, of it to get an idea. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and hit invoke. And what's going to do is load up our model and then start generating pictures for us. Um, one thing that I'll call out uh, just as SDXL as people have kind of like, you know, started to play around with the, the, two, the two prompt uh, inputs or encoders. In some systems, right. people are just passing both of those in into both encoder fields uh, we have flexibility on our front end to do whatever you want and so basically there's this concatenate prompt um, button which if you turn off will kind of like disable that little link um, if you have it on what's going to happen is the top prompt 
will be concatenated to the style and passed into the second encoder, and the prompt alone is passed into the first encoder. So if you want, if you want the same thing in both, you put everything in the top. If you want to experiment with splitting okay. them um, and having like just the style in the second and just the subject in the first, uh, you can turn concatenate off and have that. Or if you okay. want subject in the first okay. and then subject and style in the second, that's where the concatenate comes in. So it's then a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit of an and experimental. Because I haven't really experimented with this stuff a whole yeah. lot yet. If you uh, don't, so... if you don't have the subject in the second encoder input, you don't really mm -hmm. get a whole lot of it. It does this the style that second uh, encoder. I think it's the um, the G uh, encoder clip G. That is like very very powerful. It influences the images quite a bit. Interesting. Um, okay. But what we found is you can get um, some interesting results. Maybe maybe we'll experiment and show that the difference yeah, because that would be cool right experimenting is always great yeah uh so we've got swamp our monsters. yeah we've got our swamp monsters um Ooh. some of them you'll notice are very similar to the other and i think that is this one's a black and white line art sketch and then this one is also black and white line art sketch yeah so it. show me go through that slowly because i was going to ask how you see uh yeah. what your what each of them is so yeah, so it really fast, quite because see. I turned combinatorial generation off, what it did was just mm -hmm. random, randomly picked from those. And so that was kind of the first yeah. thing that we tried. Um, you'll see that it kept the uh, seed the same. And we've got a black and white okay, line so on sketch. That little info button, and it's going to tell you what it had chosen. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the metadata super quick. Uh, you can press the I key uh, for info, and that'll just show your uh, metadata for this. Um, and yeah, you can use any of the individual metadata elements from your images. You can have those pop in. So if you want to steal the seed, if you want to steal the model, if you want to steal steps, you can just hit any of those. Um, so I'll just take this down to 20 to show you. I'll hit, uh, okay. steps and it takes it over and adds that into my options. Uh, so you can always use all, and that'll take everything from your metadata and pop that in. Um, but the I key allows you to kind of go in and see the individual pieces. So we've got our watercolor, our colored pencil, and our black and white. Um, those all got generated. And, you know, I think this watercolor, you can see the watercolor elements in sure. uh, colored pencil. I'm like looking to see if I can, I, I, it still feels a little watercolory to me. Watercolor um, yeah. <laughs> Still feels a little watercolory. The black and white, uh, you know, obviously has its Isn't own. Isn't black and vibe. white. It's not black and white. Yeah, yeah. we're not going. We're not going to say that. You know, the oh, get, yeah. the SDXL model is like not listening to us. It's just more complicated. You got to experiment with us. You know, you got to play. Hundred percent, all the time, yeah. and we're yeah. we're we're just messing with prompts right now. So true. Now you can also in invoke our up weighting syntax is different than. I think maybe everyone else, except for any Great. of the any of the UIs that use Compel. Um, Compel came out of the Invoke AI project. It's a um, essentially like manages the cross attention controls for prompt syntax, and that is what most of the diffusers community uses. So that's Hugging Faces um, community, um, and the Compel syntax. Um, if I do the traditional like wrap things in parentheses, doesn't mean anything. Does nothing. Does nothing in invoke. Okay. All okay. that's doing is grouping those words together. So it groups them so that if you were to wait something, so if I were to say uh, in, in invoke, you use the plus to upweight something, that plus is applied to everything in the parentheses, right? Uh, so I can do an individual term like I want black plus, or if I group those together, uh, I can have all of my pluses applied to each of those things. Gotcha. And so you're also not doing a number. It's just like how many pluses? Well, you can do a number as well. So I can do the, the plus or I can do 1.21. Um, it's whatever you want to do. I, either is fine. Uh, what we don't do is the colon 1.5 or anything like that. You don't use the colon to, gotcha. to weight things. No colon. You, you group it in parentheses and either do plus plus 
whatever many pluses you want or the number and that'll actually handle that for you pluses you can do 100 pluses it'll be it, you'll blow yourself out of the water with that if you do that um you can know i do I, an example of some pluses here <laughs> you know we can uh we'll do black and white plus 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 uh we'll do pencil plus and then we'll do charcoal plus plus and maybe maybe painterly is what gave us that like watercolory look so i'll take that out Please. uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn combinatorial generation on and do max prompts of four and that'll just make sure that we get all of those uh variables that we put in uh and we'll generate uh and we'll go take that okay i see a hand up there yeah. they're in the back you um i love this whole plus thing it makes me think do you have a does do, do you have a minus do you do minus if you want to do, do minus less? we do minus if you want to do less um yeah it's, it's 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 a very intuitive system plus and minus um but yeah you can do that on individual terms or uh if you put the parentheses just like math right uh, if you yeah. have parentheses, you're kind of multiplying by the entire group. That that's kind of how we think about it: is you're applying a weight to that entire just group. Just like math. Just like math. Who knew? It, it all comes back to math. For me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to math in the end. When that's we're not true. About I know the math. I know the parentheses math things. Yeah, I mean they they teach that pretty young. Like, they teach that pretty they young. They do. Yeah, they teach. Pretty foundational. Young. Um, I, I do think our pluses had an impact based on the previews that I'm seeing here. Uh, and I think taking out painterly probably will give us less of that watercolor vibe. Uh, and I think we're almost done with our entire batch here. So having those load in. Uh, so this yeah, one is our black and white. charcoal. That looks a lot more charcoal. That looks a lot more charcoal y. Yeah, 100%. Uh, this, this one's kind of cute. It's like a toad uh, watercolor. Uh, Dude, I love cool. monsters. Uh, black and white line art sketch. And so, again, we're using the same seed here. So, you see a lot of structural similarities. Yeah. Uh, this one's got like a third leg and maybe some wings going on. Uh, and then we've got our, um, I think this is colored pencil. Yeah, this is our colored pencil, which it looks like colored pencil to me. So, that's yes, yeah. kind of how we're you know, using those dynamic prompts and the weights. Um, those are some fun things. Um, yeah, any questions about that? Is that all tracks make sense? Everyone's um, just saying how intuitive and awesome it is. So yeah, I mean, it's intuitive, although, you know, some people will uh, say, you know, I wish I could just put a 1000 uh, parentheses, because that's what I'm used to. And, you know, there's no no hate on a 1000 parentheses. But I agree. It's, I think yeah. we think it's a little bit more intuitive. Um, but that's dynamic prompts. Um, it's pretty fun. You can get pretty insane with dynamic prompts. You can nest them. You can like create a hundred images, and then that's just you know you, you're uh, generating a ton of ton of stuff and a yeah. ton of variations, uh, which is super and fun. You're getting a bunch of different interest stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great tool while, for while you're testing, etc. Yes, and that does use a fixed seed um, right now, so you're you are always comparing that kind of like similarity between all of those images and kind of what what exactly the words are doing differently um so that's fun uh, yeah that's that's a fun one I, I enjoy uh dynamic prompts and i think there's uh, a lot of value in that um i think awesome. big question for the stage and folks that are watching um is there like a top of mind thing that people really want to see get used i mean i think maybe we could do some canvas stuff that'd be kind of neat right yeah i think we could but i i have yes I you have in the back her, right there I'm, I'm like hermione and like yes uh, uh. i love it I love um it. okay so uh the seamless tie yes yeah yeah uh can uh, we talk about that yeah, so seamless tiling. Um, oh, what I do have a question, sorry, going back to what we were just talking about. Sure. Uh, so schmix, schmix, I love the, I love Three pluses channel. would be 1.3. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. No, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Uh, these are, um, this is going to get more mathy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. This is it. <laughs> Just it's, because math goes over my head doesn't mean other people don't yeah. love it. 
So two, two pluses is 1.1 to the power of two. So 1.1 times 1.1 gives you 1.21. So that's what two pluses equals. If I do plus plus, I'm getting 1.21. If I do three, it's multiplying that by 1.1 again. And so you get 1.3, uh, one, something like that. So it's just some, some 1.3. Oh, it's close to 1.3, but it's a, little, it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so it, you can use, I mean, I, 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 I know that everyone thinks that there's like this like very specific science to this stuff where it needs to be exactly 1.35 yeah. to get that like touch. But I think you'll be okay regardless if you do 1.3 or 1.32. It, you know, it's a spectrum and you can use pluses as kind of a shortcut or if you want to get very specific and put the number, you can do that. Um, I, I'm not one of those people who is so like... Uh, I don't, I'm not dogmatic about the way you ought to yeah. do it. I think it's, it's a lot more uh, touch and feel, uh, just like all good art is. You get kind of kind of like feel it out and get your intuition built as you play with it. That's how but I great, feel too. Great Button question. Mashing. Great question. Great question. Indeed. From the audience. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about seamless tiling. Seamless tiling. Yeah. Uh, seamless tiling uh, does some fun stuff with the unit. Uh, to force the model to generate uh, images that are seamless on either the x-axis, the y-axis, or both. Uh, so basically, okay. if you wanted to create a pattern, uh, let's let's just say you're going to go, you know, you create one of those notebooks uh, that you had as a kid that had that beautiful, like you know, fun pattern on it with fruits or whatever, like fun shape it was, uh, unicorns, ponies, whatever it is. Uh, you can create seamless tile that will, if you replicate that and expand it out and just repeat that pattern, it will just, it's a pattern. It, it, it's seamless and you can kind of link those up together. Uh, so seamless tiling does that. That's um, you know, something can, you can import into Photoshop and then you can use their. Yeah. Or if you're, um, you know, game import designers. Import it as a pattern or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You can import it as a pattern. Uh, game designers can bring that in as a textured asset for. Um, you know, games. So, you know, see a lot of people use that for like, foliage on the ground or grass or brick walls, things like that. Um, you can do a lot of uh, interesting stuff with it. And seamless tiling does work with SDXL. So we have SDXL nice. seamless support and 1.5 seamless support. Um, awesome. And that's pretty fun. Um, we have found this is just you know the you know tip, tips from the inside we've we found that some prompts will cause some minor seams on the edge that you have to clean up okay. uh but we've got some um updates coming in 3.2 that we think will basically give you more flexibility we're going to add um basically like a seamless pressure uh slider and you can force oh, nice. it to just be like i don't care if you're prompting for a dog i i want you to make it seamless because what's what's happening is it's trying to create something coherent while also trying to maintain the seamlessness, and so it can get a little confused. But uh, right. that'll come out in three dot two. We can we can test it out in any case right now, and I think you'll probably see for the majority of it, uh, it's going to be nice. We'll do rainbow pattern texture. Uh, I don't know, vibrant, psychedelic, uh, illuminescent. I'm just throwing words out now. What do you got in there? Um, pink. Extra detail. What did you say? We already said rainbow, so we can't say pink. Uh, extra detailed uh, uh, cart cartoon outline. Outline. Let's Why see not? What happens. Let's not yeah. see what happens. Uh, do we have anything else we want to change? I don't think so. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just give it a shot uh, and see what that gives us. Um, but yeah, that's, that's fun to play with. Um, I think that your, obviously your results may vary, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Um, yeah. what I've found is it's really, really interesting for more surreal patterns to have that kind of seamless element. Cause everything just kind of like goes super wacky and wild. Uh, but this one, that one's a pretty cool uh, pattern that's coming up right here. I like that so a lot. So wait, can we go down to the, uh, can we, 
scroll down to the whatever's the things are on the seamless pattern is it just turning it on or turning it off turning on for each access so x or y axis okay. down at the bottom and i I'd, I'd scroll further if i could but that's the bottom it's the bottom of the list that's okay that okay. um, doesn't matter it's great yeah so we've got some interesting patterns coming in this one's kind of like all rainbows uh i like the i think the cartoon outline gave it some interesting looks um and if you look at the edges you'll see that they basically just line up right so like we've got the bottom yeah. of the rainbow here the top there, top of the uh, there. all yeah. of this kind of stuff there this one's all cool uh so you get some like you know you get some interesting um stuff that you can go tile and pattern i i have my background on my computer is actually uh from testing this when we were testing i had like a oh, nice. surreal alien fruit oil painting and now it just like is tiled across my background it's great i love it very so it's cool. super fun Okay, um, awesome. So that's very intuitive and very nice. Uh, just, yeah. I mean, most of this all is very intuitive. So. You just turn it on or turn it off if you want to. Oh, turn it on, turn it off. But it's nice to know what it is. Um, yep. So the only other thing I think that we didn't go over last time was no noise. Yeah. Noise. Noise is pretty simple. Um, there's really only one setting here. I mean, it's very. It's. It, yeah. I think it merits the question: Why does it have its own section? Frankly. Um, and we'll probably redesign this at some point. Uh, but we made the decision in 3.0 to offer the control for noise to be generated from the CPU. So here's why. Um, historically, we always generated noise on the GPU when a GPU was available. But when people are running Invoke on a MacBook, they're not using the GPU, they're using the CPU. And so what ends up happening is you have the same seed and you're looking at the same prompt, same settings, everything. And you're like, why aren't these the same image, right? I used the same seed as you. I used all the same settings. Why is it not? Well, it's because the seed was generated by the CPU instead of the GPU or the noise was. And even though the seed's the same, they generate different noise. And so what we did with 3.0 is everything generates from the CPU by default which just gives you like by default, okay. it's all shared. Everyone can generate the same noise, but you can turn it off if for whatever reason you want to replicate a uh, noise that was generated from a GPU in the past, like you're going to try to go back and generate one of your old pictures, or if for whatever reason you just like, you know, oh, GPU noise is so much better, you know, pinched fingers, a chef's kiss, it's just the quality noise, whatever, whatever you want, um, you can, you can turn it on. I obviously ignore it and leave it on CPU all the time. It's just, I, I have no reason to turn it okay. off, but- um, If you turn it, if you hit it so that it goes on, then you are turning it to GPU noise. So this is, this is named, remember we read the name of the feature. I can't read it, it's so tiny. We're gonna see <laughs> zoom in here. Uh, there we use, go, perfect. Use, ah! Okay. CPU noise. noise, true on, Fabulous. yes, CPU, right? Yeah. So that's awesome. that's how we do that. Um, I think I might have zoomed out too much. I don't really know where my zoom is, but this seems like a good, a good place to be. Um, that's great. So yeah, that's that's uh, noise. Okay, cool. That's now really awesome. That's good to know and understand what um, is going on behind the background. Great. And I think you know if okay. if we're talking about UX design, where should this live? Probably somewhere around here uh, would be like a little hidden thing for CPU. If I'm like thinking about where that should be, it's probably in the noise area so that yeah. it's all intuitive, but we'll get there. There's going to be some redesigns on this section in the future to make it even easier. If you guys have any comments, go ahead, let them know. <laughs> uh, one thing that may have changed since the last time, uh, it might have, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, lock ratio we added this button um okay. and that whatever ratio you have uh set so if i for whatever reason i'm like you know this is the perfect ratio is 12 16 to 1024 uh you can lock that and then that'll just oh, stick nice. those together um and that where that becomes very useful is if we have i don't have a let's just generate one real quick we'll generate a um kind of an, a weirdly sized image here, uh, just to see if we can get one picture and I'll just cancel it after it's done. Um, 
when you're generating with control net, very often you're bringing in an external image, right? You're bringing in something right. from somewhere else. And it's probably not like optimally designed for stable diffusion aspect ratio. It's like some random thing, right? Uh, so if we open up our control adapter uh, and I drag in, you know, my now, this is kind of like more of a rectangle, 1216, 896. Uh, if I drag that into my control nut, um, I can use, let's just do this. Let's, let's pretend I was at 1024 by 1024. I can use the control image dimensions and just pop those up. Awesome. So I hit that button and now that's just automatically set. Uh, right. So that's really helpful for, Actually, you know. Having that problem last night. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's what you want to do is, is pull those in. Uh, you know, we debated whether we should do that automatically for you when you pull a control image in, but then we decided against it because very often you're like mishing and mashing all kinds of, you know, control images together. So it's like, which one do you want to use? hundred um, percent. What can also happen though, is if you're an artist that you've done like sketches and stuff and you've done that in, let's say like Photoshop, it's like a 4K by 3K art piece. If you bring that in, what this is going to say is something like, you know, Let's just assume that this was the resolution you brought it in at. So if you brought in that art and you brought the control dimensions up, now you're sitting with a 4K by 3K image. Well, we all know if you generate that thing, either your VRAM is going to go out or if you, if you have enough VRAM for it, it's probably not going to look very good because the model wasn't trained for it. Um, and so you can lock that ratio and bring that back down to a same size. Um, and that's kind of the... Wow. the combination of things really there cool. um that's we're looking at some other ways that we can make that even more seamless so that it's just like yeah. you know, snappy um we're also in the model metadata we'll be expanding it to include width and height information so that we can provide kind of suggestions throughout the ui of like hey you might be a little bit too big here you might want to consider right. you know resizing things um, and so we think that'll be helpful, uh, broadly speaking, for just ease of use as you're going through and using that stuff, especially because, you know, so many people are using custom models and keeping track of, like, you know, the mm -hmm. different dimensions that each was trained on. Because even some of the 1.5 uh, models have better outputs at, like, 768, even though yeah. it's, like, you know, 512 by 512 is 1.5 space, right? So uh, in any case, it's, uh, there's a lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff out there. Awesome. I love that. I love that. I learned that. I love it. Um, okay, and that also made me think of two things. Beautiful, I love giving you questions. What do you got for me? I know. Okay, so I have two. One that I think, well, I don't really know what order we should do them in, but one, when I was working last night, oh, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this is that it doesn't exist yet and that maybe it could become a feature. Uh -huh. um, so when I was working in Canvas last night and I was doing runs of like a, Basically, I was like in painting a small bit, trying to like make a sword or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it would do it, but I wouldn't like like part of the thing. And so in my head, I was like, I would love to be able like the way in Photoshop where you can like erase like a layer, you know what I mean? And like get the original part back, but like keep part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense? It does make sense. What you're, what you're talking about, or the way that I interpret that, is layers. Yes. Layers. Uh, and my response to that is soon. TM. Soon. Right? So there's, there's a lot. OK. I, you know, the, the, fun, the fun thing about our Canvas, and I think there's a lot of, like, um, there's a lot of really cool things about our Canvas. But in AI time, this is, like, this is the dog that needs to be put down is like really old, right? Our canvas, we, we shipped our canvas and the code that powers it in December of 2022. Holy shit. Holy shit, right? So it is yeah. old and we haven't really made that many changes to the UI, the UX of it. It's, it's just been like, you know, solid, reliable uh, code that's just worked for that long. And we've kind of added new things and obviously like SDXL and so on and so forth. But the core code that runs the Canvas UI has not changed. Um, and so Canvas 2.0 is one of those roadmap features that we have coming up. And that's going to be kind of like uh, 
um, now that everyone has a canvas, right? I feel like, you yeah. know, this is like, okay, everyone's got a canvas. Well, you know, those really haven't pushed the boundaries of what an AI first AI native canvas would look like. And so we've got a lot of really cool ideas for that. The, the one thing I'll caution or just like call out because, you know, people always ask about it. We're not trying to be Photoshop, right? We don't, we yeah. don't think Photoshop yeah. is uh, the right tool for AI first image manipulation, right? So because like when you go into Photoshop, if you played around with Firefly, you know, they have some elements of what, what we did on the canvas that they've taken and kind of like done a really good job of incorporating it in the Photoshop UI. And I think that it, it works well for what they're trying to do, which is very simple prompting in an existing canvas and like zero overhead, zero like messing with any of these things. But when you are really going in and you want to get more detail in a specific area, if you want to add you know, components, if you want to switch models, add Laura's, you need an interface that's really designed for AI, especially when you start bringing in things like control, right? Or control adapters. And so we have a lot of really interesting ideas, especially with like image prompts of how an artist who's using these tools will be referencing and kind of like pulling in different controls and stuff like that as they're going through. And, you know, I, I won't exactly. say that we've nailed the UX on that yet, um, because, you know, if you, if you have paid attention between 3.0 and 3.1, we added a whole host of control net, like utility slash quality of life features on the canvas, which we touched on last time in the stable stage, but those came from sitting with artists who are using our tool and watching them suffer. And like in, in yeah. when you're building <laughs> software, the 100%. most like painful thing is to yeah. watch people suffer. Cause you're like, I know how to solve this. We must solve it. And so those are the ideas we've had. We've got some kind of like early quick wins, which you'll see and we'll kind of use. But overall, I mean, I think you can imagine what a really good experience would be like as an yeah. artist trying to create on the canvas. You really want like, you want to put your idea out there and you want to rough in saying like, this is where the, this is where the cathedral will be in the back. And you know, it's going to exactly. be like ethereal 100%. fog all the way up through here. And then you just want the AI to help you make it real, right? And that's what yeah. you're looking for. Um, so we've got that kind of UI UX um, being thought through right now. You know, we're, we're very much focused on improving uh, everything. And I think the, the one thing that uh, the team, uh, we, we often are, it's one of our values as a, as a, as a company is uh, we have high bars for ourselves. And then when we meet those, we raise them. So we're yeah. always kind of like setting, setting higher bars. Um, and I, even though we, we have a usable user experience, we have a lot of things that we know we can do to make it even better. And so we're constantly working on doing that. But uh, that stump speech aside, uh, maybe we jump into the canvas and play around with that a little bit. <laughs> um, I wonder if my second pseudo question might morph, morph into this because you mentioned um, mashing control nets. Mm -hmm. And this is. So when you were when you were saying that, thinking, when you were thinking in your head, were you thinking about mashing control nets? It's like it's the same image. Uh, but you're just doing like a canny and a depth and a something like that? Or are you thinking uh, different images that you can uh, then you mash together by basically creating like a control net uh, base of being like, I have a picture of a cathedral, I have a picture of a swamp, and I have a picture of like a person, and I want to control net those and make them into like a base control net and then do a run on top of all, all of the that. above, all of the above are um, things that we, so, so photo bashing, right. Is our like favorite term for mashing images mm -hmm. together. Map bashing is kind of the colloquial term we've developed for exactly. control net inputs. Right. Um, I think the real question is the way that we look at everything that's happening on the left-hand side of the screen is your you're prompting the system using different ways of communicating your intent, right? So text and language is 
kind of like the most, I guess, intuitive way of saying this is what I want. But it doesn't really capture the semantic content always of what is in here. Because when I say dog, and you think of dog, when I say that to you, we might have completely different images of what dog means. And the model certainly does, depending on what it's trained on, right? Um, which is why, you know, when, when people talk about biases in the model, it's all tied to the training data that it has and what it, what it believes the world to look like, right? If we want to get anthropomorphic on it. Um, but if I can show you what a dog is to me, if I can say, look, when I say dog, this is dog, that's image prompt, right? So IP adapter coming soon, yeah. image prompt, dog. Well, now, now we're talking about the same dog because I'm, I'm prompting you with this kind of like image content, right? And so there's, there's a lot here that um, is interesting to explore in how are we interfacing with the model to communicate our creative intent and get it out as easily as possible. And I think right now, there's some work involved in that because I think with like map bashing, for yeah, example, 100%. it's like, okay, you know, I've got to get it visually so that it understands where to, to pay attention and generate certain elements. But when you're using multiple IP adapters, for example, not that this is like out of the box intuitive right now, you're, you're kind of jamming two image concepts together. And so you're going to be able to play around with that as a way of mashing stuff up. I think over time, our perspective is a lot of this is going to evolve into some of these tools working together in such a way that you're, it's kind of picking up what you're trying to get at more in a more articulate way and just helping you generate it. And I think that's where we're going, right? I think uh, if you look over the last year, all of the, all of the integral developments of like the stuff that makes people excited about this are related to control and getting your kind of like intent or vision captured, whether that's training a new uh, Laura to get that concept in, or whether that's showing the model and image prompt to using control nets, whatever. It's all about how do I get creative control? And over time, I think a lot of these systems will get woven together in a really elegant way uh, to help you do that. So again, another stump speech, but we'll, uh, we'll move on into- That's great. Canvas. The answer again is soon we're working on it. It's going to be awesome. Soon we're working um, on and it. Let's go to, yeah. So let's head on over to Canvas. Maybe okay. we should take one of the, do we want to work Swamps. with one of the batteries? Or we want to work with one of the fun little swamp guys. Uh, I think the swamp guys look pretty cool, yeah. honestly. Um, that guy, that guy, the guy with the- This guy, this like little mosquito up, looking dude. Up, up, up. The guy with the, oh, Is that it? one, yeah. Yeah, look, he's like half, toad half warthog yeah we like that we like that mm -hmm. um so i guess the first question i'll ask here i'm gonna get my bounding box and again uh for those of you who are new to invoke um some some people <laughs> some people don't like the bounding box aspect of the canvas um they're used to i th i believe in Auto eleven eleven. Correct me if I'm wrong. You don't have any concept of a bounding box. You just draw the mask, and it like focuses on that area. And it's basically what it's doing is, um, based on your mask, it's trying to get as small a bounding box as possible, and it's just in painting that area. What I understand, I don't. Obviously, I use Invoke uh, the most. In so, painting, yeah, that's yeah. So and this the, is good. This is leading into one of my questions. Oh, so perfect. I think you're going to answer it. I think perfect. Answer well, the the reason why we allow control of the bounding box is because it actually gives you a lot more control and guidance on what the image is going to generate. And so if you, for example, um, were to zoom in on something like this part right here and try to prompt for, you know, uh, let's see what do we have here. Let's take our prompts. I've got a watercolor line art sketch of a swamp creature. If I was using this bounding box and trying to fix like this part of the head, what's actually happening behind the scenes is, you know, the model is just focusing on this piece when it's generating. And so it's doing an image to image of that spot. And it's thinking to itself, well, I got this like blob of color here and it's asking me for a swamp creature. Maybe I need to inject a new swamp creature in this image, right? Because there's not one here. I need a new swamp creature. And what is it going to do when it generates a swamp creature? It's going to have a body. It's going to be like the whole thing, right? And that's what ends up happening uh, if you do something like, 
you know, in paint this corner with that bounding box. Yeah, um, that's what was happening to me yesterday. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and so I to ask about it. Yeah, I, well, you know, and, and that's that's one of the pieces that is when you're designing software, you have a trade-off between control and flexibility and ease of use. Because if it's really just like you never have to touch anything, you really don't have a lot of control. It's doing the way it thinks. It's kind of paternalistic in that way. It's like, this is how you yeah. should use our software. We offer a lot more control, uh, but that comes with, you have to kind of know how that bounding box works. And when you know how the bounding box works, uh, it can be very powerful. So one thing that people often use is, I believe, a detailer for faces and stuff like that in Auto 1111. And what that's doing is it's finding faces inside of the image. It's creating a tiny little bounding box over the face, and it's in painting that face at a very large resolution and then jamming that back in, right? Mm -hmm. You have that capability and that kind of power to get details wherever you want on the canvas. And so, for example, we can take, um, we can take this guy's face here, and I'm just going to mask this stuff. And I'm not going to get the edges here because I don't want to take away uh, coherence on the edges. Get all those horns, maybe. Try to get some of these over here. So we're going to do that like head. But now I have to ask myself, what am I prompting for that would match this bounding box? What is, the, what is it going to work with the model where it knows exactly what I'm looking for? You know, probably something like a close-up portrait of a swamp creature. It's going to give me something good, right? It's going to do OK. Um, yeah. yeah, swamp creature face watercolor, line art sketch, simple concept sketch, whatever. Now, at this point, if I wanted to, um, I can change the style, right? So I can do oil painting, uh, details. And now the question is, how much do I want this to change? And so if I use a really high denoising strength, like one, well, I'm kind of like, I've got no control, right? And it's just gonna say, okay, let's start from scratch. Let's ignore the original image. Let's do a completely new generation. You're gonna get something kind of wacky. If you do something low, it's not gonna change that much. You're not really gonna get a whole lot of variation. So we've got two options. We can play around with the denoising strength and kind of like fine tune it that way. And maybe, maybe let's just generate four uh, since I, we, I haven't actually hit the invoke button in what feels like I, half an hour, so maybe I should just hit that button. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I should just hit that button. So we'll generate four, and we'll see what we get. And if we find that structure is a problem, this is where control net gets really interesting on the canvas, and we'll, we'll right. explore that. So I'll do four. Um, so this, this notion of I want to give variation, I want to give flexibility, but I also want to maintain structure. Those are typically trade-offs that you're making when you're using denoising strength, right? You're kind of like yeah. getting one or the other. With control net, you actually have the ability to, I mean, you can jam that denoising strength up to 0.95, and it's going to be the same structure because control net's kind of enforcing that. Um, yeah. So we've got, uh, I, think, I think it really nailed the oil painting element of this. It did, yeah. Um, and so we're, we're getting some good options here. Um, what, what I'll also call out, because um, this may, maybe is new, maybe not. Uh, we were talking to the Hugging Face team earlier. They were asking how we were doing in painting because the in painting model came out for SDXL. They put that out and it's not really like super strong yet. They're still working on making it better. Uh, they're so trying to- you did the in painting model or not? We do support the in painting model, um, but yeah. Well, in our testing, we found you'll get better results if you just do raw SDXL in painting. As long as you know how to use our canvas, you can get like better okay. results that way. Um, so and we can even test that. No, we can go. We can go into the difference between an in painting model and a non in painting model if it would be educational for everybody. I don't want to like bore everyone with technical stuff, but you know, this is what I spend my day thinking about. Yeah. Um, we've got our oil painting swamp creature. Um, and, you know, we've got some really good options. Um, this one's particularly appealing to me. Um, this one's got some, like, funky horns on the bottom. I, I, think, I think we're going to keep this one. Um, that one's good. I like that one. And so we got a lot of detail in. 
the reason why um, I, I mentioned that with a detailer, what it's doing is blowing that up. You'll see up in the top left this note that says scaled bounding box. Okay. Thank you, yes. So our bounding box right now, this is 448 by 448. But what it's doing is it is taking a snapshot of that image right there. It is blowing that up to 1024 by 1024. And on your mask, it's doing an image to image to get the detail. And because it's a, diff it's a diffusion based process, you're getting all of that detail in at 1024 by 1024. And the SDXO model, as we know, trained for kind of like 1024, 1024 or a uh, similar uh, pixel density. And then it's shrinking that back down to 448 by 448 and plopping that in. And so that's why you see all of this like rich detail in a small space, which you typically miss in diffusion-based generation. You typically find like if this is a far off character way in the back of the room, their face is all garbled and they're kind of like yeah, you know, yeah, ugly exactly, looking, right? Yeah. So you can zoom the bounding box in on that person mask them and generate it. And what that's doing is it's almost generating a completely new image just focused on that character and then plopping all of that detail in in that tiny spot. And that's what that scale before processing is doing. That is controlled on this setting right here, infill and Thank scaling. You. That's what I wanted to ask about. Yes, you can control it. Uh, so you can have it done uh, automatically uh, or manual. And if you do manual, can you, you can- zoom in on that a little bit? I am just, just that section. That. Yeah, yeah, zoom in here. Dun, dun, dun. So in fill and scaling, um, and this is where you're controlling things. Um, you're controlling how the bounding box treats transparent areas. So in fill and then scale before processing. And because we're talking about in fill, we can talk about um, the difference between an in painting model and a non in painting model. Um, a non in painting model is just doing image to image. It's just doing image right. to image, right? An in-painting model is referencing kind of like the, the missing or masked area, everything outside of it, and using that information to control the diffusion process for what's inside of it. But otherwise, you're just doing image to image. And so the question becomes, if that's the case, what am I doing image to image on if this is empty? Because with in painting, we know that that area is just being considered a mask and it's referencing the original image. But with image to image, you can't image to image transparent stuff. There's nothing for it to image input to, right? And so what happens is we use an infill and we have four different infill options. Uh, patch match is the default. Uh, tile, highly recommend not using that. That's basically like if your computer won't run any of the other ones, you can use tile, but eh, you know, probably want to get a computer upgrade. Uh, patch match is what we initially released with back in December. It's what gave us the very high quality uh, in painting and out painting at that point in time and has worked really well since then. Uh, recently, we expanded to include Llama infill and are CD2 these new? infill. Because I don't have them on mine. Yes, these are new. These are new. Okay. Um, if, I think we just released 3.1.1. Um, and I think 3.1.1 has uh, Llama in it. Can we throw it. that link in the chat? Uh, we sure can uh, somewhere. Uh, maybe somebody, maybe uh, somebody here, maybe. Okay. Key turn, Brodsky, one of you guys can throw the invoke link in. I see you guys in the, the chat. Um, but yeah, we, you can download that and use that feature. Um, the Llama infill is probably one of the best out there. Um, it's actually used, the Llama model was originally released for kind of like content aware fill in Photoshop. It's effectively like open source content aware fill. And so if you use the llama, it's just going to like, it's going to content aware fill, and then you're doing image to image on the content aware fill. It's very cool, right? Um, but patch match is super good as well. Well, I want to um, see llama. Let's do llama. Let's do llama. Let's do llama. I want to um, see the difference. Okay, we'll do llama here. This magic thing that you've done and made and made amazing. Gonna make it's sure going to be hard because it's already kind of like. Zoom out a little bit. the best image to do it on. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. All right. Now we got, we got my Zoom all wonky now to, to try to zoom on that one thing. I'm sorry. I ruined it for you. Yeah. Uh, 
So I, me I mentioned this to you yesterday, but you don't want to go too far out. Otherwise, it's not going to pick up all the things it needs to, right? Um, you want to think about uh, what it's going to be reading. Right, exactly. Allow you to whatever, yes. And exactly. uh, Keyturn is asking, uh, these infill methods are only for the non-inpainting models? That is correct. That is correct. Um, and that is because the in-painting models don't need infill. Um, they're, they're referencing the original image as part of that like denoising process. They're not infilling and they're doing image to image. The in-painting models are completely... I decided to bring in the in-painting SXL model or whatever. I would just turn this off. It, we turn it off for you. We're not going to run anything that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, the in-painting models, um, they do it a little bit differently. Uh, and I believe in some ways that's kind of what the in-paint control net does too, is it tries to inform the generation from you know, the, the rest of the image. And that's kind of what that uh, control net model is actually doing. And the purpose of it is you're, you're getting that same type of context injection from everything else in the area that you're in painting. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, but good. in this case, we'll just, uh, we're not gonna do a close up. We're just going to uh, use our watercolor line sketch of a swamp creature uh, and we'll see how this works for us. Although I did leave my denoising strength at 0.75, so we'll cross our fingers and hope that's good enough. Um, Okay. It, sh it should be. Do you find with the in painting or with the out painting, it's better to have it like up at like one or one? One's kind of dangerous because you're effectively saying like ignore the infill, but definitely higher okay. so that it can okay. fix a lot of like the seam stuff. 0.75 is not bad. It's just on the lower end. Typically, I would say like 0 0.8, 0 0.85, you'll get a really good spot. Um, like this one's not particularly bad. It like fits well, but the style is definitely a little bit wonky yeah, a little on this. Different. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so I would see the seam change or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not too bad though. I mean, it's it's okay. Um, but yeah, it, higher denoising strength is typically going to solve some of those those types of problems. Um, if you leave it super low, you're going to see kind of the raw infill, and that's. Like with llama, maybe okay. With tile, whew, it looks terrible. It's just really bad. <laughs> um, the, the tile infill is really just like the poor man's like juggle uh, j uh, jigsaw puzzle. It's like okay, let's just try to throw some stuff in there. Um, this yeah. one looks pretty good. I mean, this I think yeah, it's got a nice good. little um, nice little shading. Um, but you can kind of see how how all of this stuff works. Um, exactly. I, I don't. Uh, aside from the color shift, there really aren't too many other themes. It looks pretty good, um, which is nice. Uh, so yeah, that's that's that piece. So there was also a thing about about this, and I think if you scroll down on the sides uh, on the side there, it's um, the composition setting. Yeah, compositing settings. Um, compositing settings. Yeah, which yeah, yeah. we we struggled with naming this um i think uh d ringer who's one of our mods is in is in uh today's uh, stable stage uh chat um he helped us come up with the naming of this um because we were trying to figure out like what is it exactly that we're doing here and what these settings control is wherever i have like the mask when we're when we're generating this, what's happening behind the scenes is we're generating an image to image, the whole thing, right? The whole block is going image to image again. And then we're taking the small area that you masked, merging that with your original image and doing another kind of like polishing pass on top of that with very low noise. And then finally stitching that together with a blur. It's like a multi-step process to get a really, really good in paint. And you know, now, now it just seems natural to say, yeah, that's compositing. It's like putting it together in a yeah. nice way. It just, it fits, right? That, that's the importance of naming features, right? So we're very, very grateful for naming it that way. Uh, but the two settings that you see in here are the two steps I just described. What type of coherence pass do you want to run? Unmasked, which is to do a second pass on the whole entire image. That is my preference. I think it looks the best. And that's, uh, I submitted a PR recently just to make that the default. Um, what we historically had been doing was the mask edge. And what that does is basically does a second pass on this like outer rim with 
maybe like 16 pixels on each side and it's doing a second image to image pass on that. What I have found, especially with SDXL, is that doesn't look super good. It creates a lot of weird like diffusion artifacts. So unmasked okay. is like the, the way to do it. Maybe what was happening to me yesterday. Yeah. Um, so I think what's interesting too to note and just for people's to see it because when i think uh, when i see unmasked i would think oh it's not reading my mask mm. but mm. what you're saying is that it's the second step of which it is unmasked so Correct. it is doing the mask and then it is doing like a second sort of overlay which is how i would do it really and, back like in six yeah. months ago when this stuff didn't exist and i would go into photoshop and like switch something up and then come up and then run the whole yeah. thing now, process again to smooth the out. one thing that I'll call out, because some people, some people are like, well, I don't want any of my original image to be changed. I don't want anything but the mask area to change. And regardless of this setting, nothing but your mask area will change. So okay. nothing outside that mask area is going to change. The setting is controlling the second generation pass. Wh which part of that is passed through like the image to image uh, process as kind of the diffusion mask. And what we've found is just doing the whole second pass on the whole image makes it super seamless. Like it just makes this thing like really stitched together really well. Um, and it does that at a low strength. You can control the denoising strength here. Point 0.3 is like what we've found is like a good way to keep the structure and stuff while getting good details. Um, it's obviously doing, um, you know, some steps there and that is all controllable. And then when it stitches the two together, which is again, the new image that's gone through this like multi-pass mm -hmm. image to image and your original, it's doing so at this mask area, right? But it is blurring the edges so that these things really just blend into each other. And you can control that through either a box blur or a Gaussian blur, and you can control the pixels. Defaults typically work for me. I, I mean, that's the power of defaults is no, nobody's probably going to change these, so they better be good I out of the box. I was doing the, uh, whatever the one that was causing the artifacts on the edge. Yeah, yeah. And I pushed up the pixels. And that fixed it. Or something, and that fixed it, yeah. Yeah, if you're doing, if you're doing um, mask edge, the steps need to be higher because otherwise it gets some really weird stuff going on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think maybe what we should do, this is kind of inspiring a thought, maybe we should just set different defaults for the different modes, right? So unmask can have low steps, and then if you switch to mask, oh, it yeah. should go higher. Um, it's a good, it's a good note. Good. I will take that and um, we'll update that. That's the, the magic of iteration. Um, so the thing I wanna do now is I wanna get kind of crazy here. And we're going Love to, uh, we're gonna mask the whole creature this whole dang thing. This uh, little guy, he's so cute. And I don't want him to change his shape. But what what can we come up with of what this creature should look like that would be kind of wildly different than it is now? Wildly different. Chat, got any ideas? Oh, Technerd's saying that that might be a way to change lighting on his pasted pink file products. Needs feathers, says Keyturn. Okay, okay, I like that. Um, what we're gonna do is we're Turn going him to go a bird. into a bird. I I think the bird would structurally change. I think feathers is probably a very yes. good suggestion here. Can we give him um, rainbow feathers? We can. We actually let's try it. Rainbow feathers. Now, what what? Would you typically say if I told you I'm not going to draw anything on here and we're going to try to do an image to image to get rainbow feathers? You'd probably have to say I'll laugh in your face. Laugh in your face. That's a silly idea. <laughs> what what a what a foolish what a foolish uh, endeavor. Yes. Um, yes. With control net, you can actually do what you need to do, which is bump up the denoising strength, but you can keep the structure right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we are saving the box region only that kind of uses this uh, bounding box as a little kind of like snapshot tool. We can kind of point it where we want to either save files or take uh, little snaps. Um, and we have this button in 3.1 called import image from canvas. And what import image from canvas does 
is uses that bounding box as kind of like a, a quick reference for control nets, right? So I'm going to use that here. Um, and we'll pass this in. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a snapshot, pop it into my control net, and then run the processing on it, right? And so what we've done is we've got our soft edge structure here. We're kind of controlling that generation. And regardless of how high the denoising strength goes, now we've got some control in our generation on the canvas so that we know it's not going to go outside those lines, um, that, which is nice, right? Um, I like to, I don't know what the cool kids are calling this, but I, I like to, I, I, I consider it almost like a, a, we're giving AI the flexibility to polish at the end of this by taking a little bit of control off the end. So it's like a little bit of like, it's like when you spin the bowling ball, it's a little bit of uh, that, that flourish. Uh, I like to reduce the control net a little bit towards the end so that you're at least uh, giving it a little bit of flexibility for those last final details. At the very end. Yeah, yeah. So you can maybe you get a little bit of feathers coming off. At the yeah, end. exactly. You don't want to like, you don't want to say exactly. don't color outside the lines when it's maybe appropriate yeah. to do so at the detailing. That's a really cool bit. tip. Yeah, I like know. that. I like that one. Um, so we'll do 90%. I mean, we could probably even explore 85. Um, we'll bump up the denoising strength pretty high here. We might need to go even higher, honestly, because we're trying to get rainbow feathers, but we'll give this a shot. Uh, we'll do two. And of a rainbow feathered swamp bird creature. I think that's exactly what people ask for, right? Um, so we'll give this... Uh, I think we'll give this a shot and see what it does for us. Um, as with all experiments, this may blow up in our face and I may look like a fool. But we will iterate until we are successful and, and get our rainbow feathered bird creature. Because that's yeah. how it works, guys. It it's not like it, it's not like it looks on Instagram or whatever where people are just like, I made this and uh, yeah, it, it, it. <laughs> it is yeah, it is good. looking kind of funky to be to be completely candid. Um, oh, he's fluffy. He is fluffy. I think his face he's got is got one kind random. Of... He's got one random thing coming out of his. He does. He's got a weird. He's, it's a weird bird. Oh, he's got one little beak. It's the bird. The bird really threw. We'll it give him another bird. chance. Okay, this is our How second about, chance. You know what it should be. You know what it should be. It should be. A feathered dinosaur. Oh, that could work. That could work. Um, because dinosaurs had feathers. There dinosaurs did have there. feathers. Dinosaurs did have feathers. And they are so they're like the reptile, the feathered reptile. Oh it's my god! Hey, I love there that. we go. I love that one. Now, there what it go. did, what it did was it's this horn on the left hand oh. side with the soft edge. Yeah. It definitely like adhered to that. Um, but you know, honestly, I think this works really well. I like it. Um, it and does. It, and rather than uh, rather than abandon our friend here, Admit I'm just Jeffrey. going to I'm going to draw some colors in here and just fix this guy up with some in painting. And we'll just say that that's like our our new friend because honestly, I, I love the um, the feathery touch on that. It just looks super cool. Yeah. Um, we won't talk and about that's it. What it did. <laughs> we never talk hands. about pants. Never talk about pants. <laughs> um, name it um, Jeffrey. I love that. Name it Jeffrey. Yeah. Now I love that little in painting thing that you did. And when you reran it, I didn't see the prompt. But did you did you keep swamp creature? Kept, kept everything. All I did was just throw in some colors, and I'm having it just re reimagine it with some color in it. In that. Um, and again, because I would, um, it would have tried to make a tiny little swamp creature in that picture. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, look at those. Wait, go back. That looks better. Those are good better. ones. Those are good ones. Um, and so, yeah, now we've got like our swamp creature. He's looking pretty, pretty good. Jeffrey uh, never looked better. He's peacocking in the swamp. I like it. Um, I mean, yeah. And you can really tell the that little bit that you ended because you can kind of see right at the top of the way the little feathers are coming off popping off in these nice textures outside of the bounding of the control net right and so now we can come in if we want to do this and we want to get some more detail on his face we can um we'll do the close-up right close-up of a watercolor lines art sketch and then we'll push this to the end of the prompt of a rainbow feathered swamp bird creature uh watercolor line art sketch yada yada and we're going to do another control net here 
and just do that soft edge again. again and we'll pull that pull that guy in for that little clip and now we've got that now, you know strut control while this is running i'm having trouble last night finding the control nets because the only thing that i had installed when we did it before was the uh, i don't remember which one it was Canny. not the other one not that not it was uh depth soft edge soft, soft edge. edge so i'm using soft um, edge right now but there are more right, right. so um there are more so where the do one, people get the yeah the one thing that this this is kind of a painful one because um i think that there are some control nets floating around that are just safe tensors files um and the safe tensors files if you drop them in you're going to get a, a response from invoke that's like sorry that doesn't work um, and it's because we use diffusers models. We use diffusers models for everything, including control nets. Um, there are diffusers control net models, and you can download those from Hugging Face. Or if you go to models.invoke.ai, there is a small collection of models that we are like, it's kind of like our MVP model warehouse. Perfect. Um, I wanted to add. Yep. And there are, I think, five control net models for SDXL in the tools tab on that website. All that is, we, we partnered with Hugging Face to make a little bit of a nice UI on top of Hugging Face repos that have diffusers models. And it just works really well. You can hit copy and then put it right in your model manager. We're not hosting the models. We're just pointing to Hugging Face stuff. So it's very, very like it's just a Hugging Face uh, front end. Um, but yeah, that's that's where you're gonna want to pull those. The I've done some testing, um, and I was talking to Sarge uh, this morning actually. Uh, Sarge X Sarge ZT ZT um, created the depth and soft edge uh, control nuts. I have done There's testing. Been a on there and i was like i don't know which one to get and then yeah. i took one of them and i was like it's okay and then yeah. one, you know yeah and the t, t to i adapters are coming those will be next up and yeah, then yeah. we'll get because that's that's kind of those are a lot smaller um but the sarge's depth control net is the best depth control net out there hands down um we could do testing right now just to prove it but it is very very good um and the soft edge is also really good. Um, and that's what we're using right now for this. Um, and I, I typically find soft edge is, I prefer soft edge over canny mo more often than see. not, just because it feels like it's got a little bit more of that, like, like you said, it's got a little bit more freedom at the edges to pick up the details. Yeah. Um, 100%. But we'll go ahead and uh, maybe so get some details in on this face while you're asking your next question. Yeah, you work on that. Yep. Work on that. Um, Keytrad is asking, do we have the ability to scribble on the control net references yet? Like if I wanted to keep the outside lines but not have the eye. Uh, you, what, what I do for that, you don't have that uh, ability on the control net like tab itself, but because you have the ability to pull in stuff from the canvas, uh, you can scribble on the canvas and then snapshot that as your uh, input control. for the control net, right? And so that, that's what I do. When I want to scribble something, I come into the canvas. What's really nice about that is you can actually take anything that you want to use as like a scribble uh, base, as long as it's like black background, white in the front, and pass that in as your scribble, right? Or draw on top of it. And sometimes I'll take so a... Of, good. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's basically like, it's like the map bashing, but without it. So like, if I did want to put in a little... Uh, cathedral or i don't know something like right in front of him yep. i would just draw like a little a little cathedral Thanks. there's a tiny little cathedral in the swamp yeah. directly in front of him i'll scribble that in and i'll control net it and it'll okay. make it okay cool um what you'll also find is if you take a canny map um of something and you decide you know i don't like that it picked up this section or this thing, I want to take it out. There's a little button here on the control net image where you can save that as an image. And you can toss that into your canvas, use black to take it out, and then use that as your control image, right? So there's a lot of right. a lot of ways. I mean, not those workflows aren't like optimized workflows. Yeah. But the gist of it is anything that you can get on the canvas, you can get into your control net input really easily. So it's just like use the canvas to do whatever you want to do. Um, and obviously when we have like uh, 
layers and stuff like that, you, you'd be able to do a lot more. Um, but, but a lot of this is just uh, evolving. So for now, it's like, you know, yeah. uh, use it as you can. Uh, but we got some more details on that face and you know he's got a very piercing red eye which i love yeah, it's very bird-like love it um, and so now we've got like our swamp creature it's perfect right this little guy you yeah, know jeffrey's looking really good jeffrey is looking, looking so good um so i guess maybe maybe we'll just do that really quick um, we'll clear the canvas um, i'll kind of show the trick here of uh there's there's two tricks if you want to draw your own image to image, you can do that, right? So uh, we'll just create a 1024 by 1024 bounding box. Um, what I have found very useful for a professional. So if you're a professional using this and you want to create assets that have the ability to be removed from the background really easily, you can create a white background and then draw in like whatever wait can you scroll up on your screen a little bit because it's not the top part is not uh or scroll or zoom out i guess the top part is not showing the which top part tools the tool the tools aren't showing uh let's see yeah. is that showing now just because you're zoomed in too close to the well on my screen I see everything. So I'm trying to figure out what it, what are you seeing? Let me see. Yeah, on our screen, we're Oh, never mind. Keep going. Wait, were you were you screen. zoomed in? Were you zoomed in? You know what? Now let's uh, on the cutting block. This part's on the cutting block. <laughs> okay. We don't make You're mistakes. doing great. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so what you'll find is if you use like generally just grays to put in structure and you set the denoising strength very high uh, so we'll do this like you know i'm doing a little bit of opacity in the middle um even though this is just like a random blob um let's do a i don't know let's do a fantasy concept art oil painting um item concept art uh detailed uh, intricate runes, uh, and then we'll do something oh, like uh, what is an object that you would find in a dungeon? Uh, some kind of like uh, a rare magic stone. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> magic yeah. stone. Uh, a, a crown, but the stone is great too. A magic uh, stone. Yeah, rough, gritty texture. Uh, think that'll probably be enough right so yeah. if i use this and i turn this up to like 0.99 this is almost noise like it's almost completely noise yeah. completely. but because we've got this very strong contrast it's going to jack up the like contrast between the noise on the outside and the noise on the inside and what we're going to end up with is probably a white background um, and we can even put white background if we want. Um, and you can de decrease the denoising strength if you want. So we'll do maybe three of these, make sure I don't have control mats on, and then we'll just uh, pop that and so stuff. I messed up, we gotta have our control, our bounding box on the, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Um, and so that'll go through and generate. This trick is super, super helpful for creating things that you wanna do photo bashing on outside of uh, Invoke. Yeah. Uh, because then you've got like this very clear contrast, this clear background, you can kind of come in and then reuse that, right? Um, so that it's it's super, it. super useful for creating assets. Um, and this can be this can be used for anything, right? You can do characters, you can do buildings, right. whatever. Okay. Um, this this can be super cool. Person. Yeah, you draw a little person and then you've got a character, right? Um, so we've got our, our cool concept like art stone. Um, which I mean, honestly, these are looking pretty, really, really cool. I like them. Um, I, I feel like I could see this in like a yeah. dungeon master's guide with some text 100%. next to it. You know, it's like very cool. 100%. Um, awesome. So that's that tech has a, has a prompt question. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's asking about, uh, periods versus commas. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to be very candid. 
a lot of this, a lot of what what we all find in this space is like this cargo cult. Like I better put you know mangled hands in the negative prompt, otherwise I'm going to get you know ugly pictures, whatever. Um, but word on the street, the cool kids are saying uh, that SDXL likes full sentences more than it likes uh, the comma separated tags. I, yeah. How true that is, I don't know. But I've been doing it anyways. It's interesting because it's like you almost can find it, it's almost like um, what's the word when you take a when you take a pill and it's sugar placebo. And, but you think it works a placebo. It's sort of like that. Like we do, th I'll do things and I'll be like, oh, this is like making this. This dude. is it, <laughs> right? This is it, and then it's like it's really not. It's kind of just like in my head, like a patient. Yeah, so I mean, but I you know, actually have pseudo found that like, and and we and we have made SDXL to, you know, be better with just generic language, like so sort of like the prompting of the past or whatever. But it still works with the commas and stuff like that too. Yeah, it, you know? it does, and and I think that's the whatever, important thing so. is there's not one right way to do it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Just experiment, kind of figure out. I, I still use commas every now and then. A lot of times I'll use the same prompt I'm using in SD 1.5 and just like pop it over into SDXL. And a lot of times it just works, right? It'll work, um, It'll work almost like that, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think um, what I've seen is SDXL, the team has done a really good job of taking some of the like, especially in the SDXL styles that came out with Clip Drop, a lot of the negative prompts were really good, right? They're like, I think they demonstrated yeah. a really good, um, healthy negative prompt rather than the nasty stuff you see on like Civit AI that's a mile long and super useless. Yeah, um, a mile long. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, but blurry they, bad woman, that's all you need. Blurry bad woman, <laughs> blurry bad, 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 mangled woman. Okay. Um, <laughs> We'll clear the canvas there and we'll show you that kind of like scribble technique. So again, what I'm using here is the fill bounding box and that just uses anything inside the bounding box gets whatever color you've got picked, right? So we'll do black this time. And then I can do my white brush on top of it for scribble. And, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna draw here. Um, draw a little, a little puppy. Oh God, this is gonna challenge my art skills. Okay, we're gonna do this one. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna do a little like no. little smiley Give face. Little face. Yeah. Give the eyes eyeballs. there. Yeah. Tiny little puppy eyeballs. Okay, this is looking more like a, a bear. A I cat. think. We'll go with a cat. We'll go with a bear. We'll go with a bear. We can change. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Oh god. This Give, him is little, yeah. Give him a little body. Okay, we're doing. We're doing. I'm, I'm just going to go with bear. <laughs> I'm giving up on the, the dog or the cat. It's a bear, guys. We it's what he wanted to begin with. What I wanted. Oh, you know, we're going to have to go to uh, we're going to have to go to SD 1.5. We don't have Scribble SDXL yet. I haven't I haven't downloaded that. Okay. Um, so as a matter of fact, this might be too big, but you know, it's control not. We'll give it a shot. Um, so we'll do this, and we'll do keep it easy. A bear. Uh, I'm so far. It's a bear. Bear, and then we'll do our scribble control net, and I'll take the uh, image from the canvas, and it's just going to use that as my scribble, right? Um, and then I don't even have to do this in the canvas. I can just take this out. Um, I still got that control adapter locked in because I pulled it in from the canvas. Um, and so I'll pull this back down to 768. It's going to take a second to load the 1.5 model um, and then start generating. But then we'll be flipping through a couple of bears. Um, I, pro I probably should t take down the, the weight or the step percentage because I think this might be a little bit too of an ugly draw, too much of an ugly drawing. I mean, it looks pretty good, actually. Give go. me a break. It okay. Looks like a bear. So while it's generating, you can turn off the display of He's the even box. running. He's, he's running through. He's running through. It looks so good. Honestly, that's exactly what I envisioned. My my human conception is coming You had kept here. drawing, that's exactly what it would have become. <laughs> it was just the beginning of that. Um, and so yeah. this last one will probably look pretty bad, though. I think this one's... Yeah. 
<laughs> or delete. Uh, and so we'll just not look at that one. Uh, but we've got some otherwise good, because it's some good pairs, right? Yeah. So that's, a, that's an easy way that you can get the scribble image in and kind of do stuff that way. Um, awesome. Yeah, and then you can, I mean, if you really like something, you can take it from here and pass that in as the next control nut, right? So we can say, exactly. boom, now we drop that in, and now we've got a control nut on now that guy. Now you can go to SDXL and then- Right, go to it. SDXL and upscale it. And upscale it, whatever. That's right. Uh, so there's a lot of little cool tricks and, and tips yeah. like that. Um, but I think really the power of what we just covered is this notion that flowing from the canvas and back into your control adapters is really easy now, right? Because you can just take little snips and pull it back out, zoom in, do details and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the canvas is a multi-purpose tool. It's not just for you know, editing or inpainting an image. You can actually create the base of an image to image if you want to generate the content that way. You can use it to create the inputs on um, you know, control net. And as I mentioned, so if we uh, hit that save button, what it'll do is it'll save our um, control net uh, as an asset. Um, and then we can drop that onto the canvas and we can edit that if we want to. So if I don't like the control net map for some reason, um, you know, maybe I don't want the, the detail here, uh, I can just kind of draw that out, right? And easily modify it and then save that as an image and use that as a control yeah. net. So you've got, you've got all of these flexible tools where you're able to edit and manipulate and pull it back in. 100%. Yeah, it's fun, fun Love stuff. Love it. Do we have, uh, well, do we have any Draw missing, missing, oh, you want a cathedral with this control net image? I don't know. I've been on a cathedral, but you haven't seen it. I'm ever ever it since that. I said cathedral, it's like, yeah. It's, I know. it's just stuck in my head. It's that theater, uh, the callbacks. You got to have them. Um, yeah. Okay. Was well, there anything that you that that inspired from you or the audience that you want to cover with all of this newfound information? Uh, I just want to go play with it now. Yeah, I know. How does it do cars? <laughs> uh, How does it do cars? It does cars really well. As a matter of fact, do we yeah. want to do some cars? I mean, people like cars, right? Yeah, you could do cars. Um. So let's do this. This is what I, I'm going to show you another trick. How about that? We'll do another trick. Um, yes. What I found with control net, um, some cool stuff. So we'll go back to our uh, SDXL Dream Shaper model. Um, and we're going to do a, a car, but not just any car, a fast luxury okay. car. We're going to do a line art sketch, uh, white and black. Um, white background, uh, bold, thick ink lines, industrial design, uh, product sketch. We'll see if we, we can get something there. Um, I'm going to pull this back up. I actually want to do 16 by nine, um, primarily because I want to get like that wide image that has a car. And I'll kind of walk you through the thought process here. I need to take black and white out of this uh, negative prompts. And everything else looks fine. I don't want a cross-eyed car or closed-eyed car. Don't want that. Um, <laughs> hey, it's little, things, it's little headlights could be cross-eyed. <laughs> could be. It could be if we're getting like a Pixar car. Um, what, what I'm going for here is I'm getting kind of one of those uh, initial like you know, concept sketches that car companies right. are doing for like, what should the next car look like? Maybe it should have six wheels, right? Have, Who knows? It have, like, all of <laughs> for whatever it is, all of these should have six wheels, right? So that that's I mean, cool. Um, but what we're doing is we're we're using it to create a sketch. It's still six wheels. Okay, this one doesn't doesn't have six wheels. That's good. We're using it to create a sketch. But if you think about it, we can then pass this in as a control net for the kind of the ability yeah. to get the structure, right? And so if I want yeah. to, what I can do is I can send this to the canvas. Now that I've got a sketch, I can do things like fixing weird details that are going to come out in the control net if we did like a soft edge. Uh, so out here. Uh, so we'll do 
this. And now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of going in and saying, okay, what are all the lines that I don't like on this like design, right? Yeah. So I can kind of like easily push those out. Um, and that line there. Do we have any other lines we don't like? Uh, this should go away. Maybe this should go away. Uh, yeah. That. Stuff should go away. Got this. I mean, you know, I'm just doing a rough pass on this because I don't really care. I'm not like worrying about what it's actually going to look like. I'm mostly trying to get it to fix itself for when I pull it in as a control nut. Um, and then now that I've got this, uh, I'll save that image uh, to my gallery. And that's up here now, right? So now I've got my like edited image. And I can pass that in as a control adapter. We go back to our fave, the uh, soft edge. I mean, we could also use um, canning as well. Um, pull that in. You guys can also do multiple. You, you can do multiple. So if we wanted to do multiple, we could do oh, this yeah, plus a depth. No. Um, so I'll do yeah. a depth. Which is usually, yeah, you'll do like a canning or soft edge plus a depth. And we'll see what that depth looks like for this guy. It, might, it probably will pick up a lot of the depth. I think it. I think it will at least. Um, yeah, good enough, right? It's got. Yeah, I would say it's good yeah. enough. Um, yeah. If we're if we're kind of concerned about it at all, we can like you know again take down the end so that it structurally provides the early stuff but doesn't fiddle with any of the details. Uh, similarly, I'm going to do the same on the canny. Is just kind of take off a little bit of that end. Uh, our control nut is on, and now I can do a fast luxury car. I'm not going to do white and black. I'm not going to do any of this kind of stuff. Uh, industrial, I'm going to even take all this. Um, we'll do commercial photography. Um, realistic. Yeah, a red fast luxury car. Commercial photography, um, not realistic. We'll do... Uh, dynamic lighting. Uh, what is the the funny one that everyone uses? Eight K. Maybe we go to twenty K. Everyone twenty thousand. Two hundred K. Two hundred K. Um. Uh. We'll do ad advertisement. Uh, car advertisement. Right. Those are always looking pretty good. Well, we'll give it a shot. Right. We'll see what that gets. Like. Um. We've got our resolution, but if we want to double check, um, you know, we can always hit the control image resolution. That kind of actually did change that a little bit. So 704 up on the bottom. Um, all of that is on. For sale. Andre is saying for sale works with car prom. Oh, okay. Uh, for sale. <laughs> uh, it's like, a, is this a used fast luxury car? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We'll do it. We'll do it. I, I trust. I trust you, Andre. I trust Maybe you. Uh, well, we'll just give it. Give it a shot. We'll generate three of them and, and see what we get. Um, but what I have found is this is a really cool way to get just you know a rough um, rough shape in for something that you like and can control, and you can kind of like you can more easily manipulate it when it's a white and black sketch of something before you're actually generating the final image. Because if you're fiddling with the colors, if you're fiddling with that dimension, it's a lot harder. Yeah. If you're just focusing on like white and black structure, it's a lot easier. Um, and then we've got like our cool, you know, red car that comes out of it. Yeah. Our cool red car. Cool, fast, red luxury cool. car. For sale, $8,000. Yeah, it's for sale. Look at that baby. That's it. I drive around in that. I don't know if you'd fit in it. It looks very compact this way <laughs> it does it's also kind of looking a little sketchy uh yeah it is a little bit like a sketch um that might be the canny cool. the canny model the canny the canny model as i found it sometimes can like instill this sketch look to the outputs um so i mean we could probably even try that as a soft edge and see if that works better for us let's hey yeah. let's try it um, and while we're doing that, while I'm switching that to soft edge, if anyone has questions, we can uh, try that out uh, or answer, try to answer good. those. It's a, it's a fun technique. Um, that is a really cool technique. I like that. And I don't know if people saw while you were doing it, but you can color pick, which is cool too. 
Yes, color picking on the canvas is nice. Um, and if you want to, I mean, this is again goes back to that technique we talked about earlier, where you're using the kind of like the white background and like that. If you wanted to, I've done this as well. We could actually go in the canvas and color this in almost like a coloring exercise right exactly. um, and then use that as an image to image instead of a text to image yeah and then you're cut you're guiding the color uh image information as you do that. and so manually because if you were like i want that door to be pink and i want the rest of this body to be green right exactly that's more like how you would have to do it that way because correct troll net isn't going to grab the Though, can you in this, can you in invoke, can you do a control net on an image to image? You can, right? Yeah. 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 You can do the control net yeah. image to image. When you have the control net. So the image to image is controlling the color. If you wanted to control the color, the control net is still controlling the shape. Yep. That's it. Uh, I think our depth this is probably coming. Some of the, the quirkiness here is coming from the depth. Yeah. Um, let's see what this next one's going to give us. Um, yeah, I, do, I think the SDXL control net space is definitely a lot like it's, it's it's finding itself. You know, it's in that like formative period where the control nets are like figuring out who they want to be. Um, I think a lot of it's going maybe to T to hide after. We have our own, which you can use in different UIs, not in this one yet. But true, we do. True. We do also have our own. True, true, true. I mean, I have to uh, shelf that out. You, know? you do. You do. You gotta. You gotta <laughs> drop. You gotta drop, them. Um, drop it. But. The really cool thing is when we drop IP adapter, uh, you'll be able to do that on the canvas as well. So you'll be able to do it throughout end to oh, end nice. of the UI. And so what that'll be really cool for, and what I'm super excited to try um, and show some techniques for, is if you want to take a clip from one area of the canvas, you can use that as a reference when you're doing work on others, um, other areas, whether that's like you know style or whatnot. So. Uh, anyways, we've got kind of like our interesting cars that came out of this uh, exercise. Um, super fun. Super fun. Uh, control, uh, tech nerd's asking about the IP2P control net. Yeah, IP2P uh, is instruct picks to picks. Um, and that in the control net. Uh, is going to work on an SD 1.5 model. I don't think anybody has instruct pick to pick um, control net for SDXL yet. Probably shouldn't say that. I don't think that we do. Uh, uh, yeah. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, please. I mean, if it, if there's one out there, we just need to, we just need to download it. Um, yeah. But if we use IP to P, that much better and or that you really, I don't know. I think as with, with everything, nothing is, nothing is perfect. All of this yeah. is experimental and kind of like in certain use cases, it does really good stuff. Like if I, if I have a house and I say make it like on fire, it blows that house up like crazy, right? It's like fire everywhere. Yeah. It's great. Um, if I say, you know, uh, if I'm using more uh, vague language or if, if it just doesn't really understand what I'm getting or if I'm asking too much of it, it's not going to really work. Um, but we'll use IP to P here and we'll say, um, now you're, now you're going to be testing my, uh, we'll do that as the input. So IP to P, um, I'm going to lock this and make this at a smaller resolution just because we're on SD 105, um, make it a watercolor painting, right? Um, we, we've got like we're on a watercolor kick today. Mm -hmm. um, and so what IP to P, what the prompt is asking for is not like describe an image. It's more of like describe what changes you want to make to this image. And so in this case, so we asked prompting, it, You don't have to say red car, this, 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 this. It's just just do this to this image. Correct. Um, and so. We'll turn off our progress images. So now it's made that car a uh, watercolor painting, right? Yeah. Um, kept kept the structure uh, and then just like it did a style transfer based on what you were asking. For. Basically, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we've got like our watercolor cars. Uh, we could do it, you know, whatever you want it Which to be. I make mean, it more. Could do in the other one 
too, just by saying watercolor at the end of it, and it would yeah. make it watercolory. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it helps that you don't have to like prompt as much, or it's just more intuitive prompting, I guess. In uh, editing I, again, I mean, really it, when when we think about, you know, why why are we adding features? A lot of it is um, there's this core question you ask, which is what is the user actually trying to do? Like nobody's yeah. coming in and saying, I would like to use an instruct picks to fix model. That's, that's what I came here for. Everyone's like, I just want to create that thing that's up here. I want to make that real, right? Or I want to, you know, pull style and plop it over. And so if you have an easy way to do that without saying like, you have to do an instruct picks to fix model and you need to have it on settings mm -hmm. 45 and this and that, whatever, it, that's, what, that's what you're going for. And I think a lot of these things are interchangeable in the sense that they're diff different tools to get to that same goal of whatever it is you want. I mean, you could certainly go in and use like image to image and control nets to get like a lot of this uh, shifted over while maintaining color, for example. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, but yeah, I, I think Instruct Picks Picks is a cool model. Um, th this is obviously like a very easy way to get it to do a very significant style transfer while maintaining structure. Um, Thank you. Now understands, or they understand. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Well, freaking fabulous. Is there anything else off the top of your head, or anything else that the uh, in the onyx? We're getting to wrap up on time here. Yeah. I mean, let's let's open open floor for questions. Freaking really interested in or want to hear? Um, I know it's hard because we got a great teacher and a very intuitive thing here, but now is the time. Um, we'll wait. We'll wait. Well, I see people are typing, so we'll just hang out for a bit. Um, but yeah, uh, the instruct model is implemented as a control net model. Yes, it's a type of control net model, correct? Now, in other UIs, you can actually get an instruct picks to picks extension, which is just using right. the core instruct picks to picks code. Um, the control net I have found is like mostly the same thing. Um, and so we, we don't implement the same thing five different ways. We pick one way that we think is like the way to implement it. And we, we do that since we're like a fully integrated application. Um, mm -hmm. So we just, have, we just use the control net for instruct picks to picks. Um, but we do have with IP adapter, that is going to be um, a direct implementation that's not like a separate, um, it's not like a, a side sidecar um, extension or anything like that. It's an integrated model. Uh, that we'll use IP adapter for. Um, so be cool. Okay, great. So I was asking, this is a bit off topic. Am I correct in saying that Invoke also has built in API you can enable to interact with? We do have an API. Um, if you go to slash docs, when you open up our app, you get our full open API, it's like Swagger docs. Um, and you can hit hit all of the APIs that the front end is accessing on the back end. The one thing that I will call out is that our API is a graph execution engine. And what I mean by that is everything that you see here, as we've talked about in the past, is, a, is built on top of this node's backend, right? All of this app is built in executing these types of graphs, which is what you might see in Comfy. We have a UI that sits on top of that. So while you can come in and create all the graphs, we actually have the UI that's accessing those. What that means is when we're generating anything from the linear UI, which is all of these other tabs, it's composing this graph automatically on the, the back end and then passing that into the API and saying, go run that graph for me. And so that's kind of what you would have to use in order to um, use the API. However, what people have started to call our, our workflows um, engine is a, like a developer IDE or a integrated developer environment for interacting with the Invoke API, right? Like you're, you're able to come in and see a lot of the data that you would need to pass. You can see the JSON of the entire graph here as well. So if you need to pass in a workflow, you can actually take this JSON and use that as the object you're passing to the API. So this is a very useful tool for interacting with the API if you're building something on top of Invoke's backend as well. 
saying that when you're up in the other ones, it's basically creating like a graph in the background. Yep. Is there in my head, then suddenly I was like, well, can I get that graph? You sure can. Um, so if you go into, you remember how we looked at like the metadata earlier? Yeah. There's a workflow tab. Uh, oh man, I didn't pass in the workflow. That's okay. not work. It's not work. <laughs> um, you, how about this? In the next version, which has a bug fix for this, you will be able to get the workflow for it. Um, awesome. Yes, uh, the, so the then workflow, you could be like, I love what I've done with this image. I want to see the workflow, then yep. I can take that, then I can take it into the workflow editor and then maybe mess with stuff there or see stuff right. there. Right. The, the other thing is we're also thinking about um, a simple way that you could configure all the settings on this and then just say, drop it in the workflow editor. So it's like a good start to a text to image workflow that has all your settings right. and it's built out for you. And then you can just go do the mods that you want to do in, in the workflow engine. Right. Um, so this just becomes just a very fluid way of interacting with different um, parts of the software. It, it, it is fun. There's a lot of fun stuff happening with Invoke. Um, yeah, do we have any questions coming in from folks? Uh, people are asking about the Google, about a Google, Google Colab notebook. Uh, I would which... say um, Colab, there's a um uh Kamenduru. i can find the link and share it um he's got Kamenduru. a yeah Kamenduru. he's got an invoke ai collab repo i'll post it here i haven't tested it on 3.1.1 okay. but i think for the large majority of it it just just works um I th so i think it's recent as of 3.0.1 um so he if you're interested in that, you might want to go ask him to update it. I don't think the update would be too much for, for that to be to get up to 3.1.1. Um, but that'll work in Colab. From what I understand, I mean, I, you know, I've been busy this week, but I've heard some like recent grumblings of uh, Colab shutting down stable diffusion notebooks on the free tier. Um, I believe we've escaped that wow. wrath so yeah. far, but I don't think it's going to last for very long. Um, so uh, use it while you can if it still works. And then, you know, uh, pray to the great big G in the sky uh, that they'll let you keep using Colab for a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, we do have some minute typing. Don't know if it's a last minute question, uh, but in case you weren't looking at the chat, Techner did say thank you for using YouTube video that you guys did on the workflows. Yeah. Um, if you guys are interested in learning um, more basics about how the technology works and not just invoke, but the core underlying diffusion technology and kind of like mm -hmm. what is exactly happening when you prompt for something and what are the parts and pieces of all this, um, we have a fund fundamentals series, um, which I will be extending to include Canvas um, stuff, the stuff that we've covered today. So you won't need to watch it because you're already experts at this you now. You already know. Um, but we'll yeah. be releasing that sometime soon and uh, continuing kind of the educational series on how this can be incorporated into workflows, especially because we're our, our main user base are professionals. Like we're working with artists and yeah. creative designers and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of what we need to teach them is not just how do I go create cool pictures inside of you know this this great tool, but a lot of artists they've learned how to work an entire like they've a career doing it one way, which is they have to create it all, and now they're trying to figure out how and where they can incorporate this in while still maintaining their creative vision. Because if you're sitting with I sat with an artist and we were on the canvas and I was like, ah, oh, well, you know just do another couple generations and see if we get one that doesn't look weird. You know, that, and, and an artist is like, I can draw this. Why am I just clicking yeah, and yeah. look over and again? I'll just go do it myself, right? And so you have yeah. to really help them uh, figure out where it plays well with their workflow and where they just want to pull this out and kind of use it uh, as the beginnings exactly. of something in Photoshop. But um, all in all, there's a lot of really fundamental information that everyone needs to understand. And that's what we're trying to cover in this fundamental series. Our audience learned so much. Everyone, go jump on over to that YouTube tutorial to just uh, eat up 
all of the other information that they have out there. Delicious for you. morsels. Um, <laughs> I love this UI so much and I cannot wait to see it keep growing and keep using it. It is now my go-to 100%. All right, take care everybody.